Hello everyone, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Thank you so much for being here. I hope this finds you well and uh, good fortune follows. I hope I hope uh, you're here to, to find inspiration and tools to help you practice and strengthen your practice. Um, that's what we do. Um, this Go Show It's about a time when Nichiren was exiled to Sado Island and a lot of people on the, you know how desperate that situation was, and a lot of people on Sado, um, they, um, they didn't like him being there. You know, the government was putting out its propaganda, this is a bad guy, this is why we're sending him to Sado. But amongst those people were some that were curious and came to become supporters and friends and actually devout uh, followers of the Lotus Sutra through Nichiren's tutelage. Um, and so they brought him food. Um, they risked their lives because some of these, you know, this was a samurai time. So whether you were a samurai or not, violence was the order of the day. And if you were doing something that was perceived to be something the government didn't like, everybody seemed to ha take it upon themselves to have license to enact some sort of sentencing of their own. So um, they could have easily beheaded the, this couple, uh, husband and wife, uh, both uh, notable uh, in society, but remaining on Sado Island um, for reasons that are only clear to them if we could talk to them, but had a lot to do with government and, uh, and so on and so forth. At any rate, this Go Show is a, is a thank you to both of them. Um, but more than that, um, it's especially directed to the wife. So for all the ladies out there, um, there's a very important distinction in the teachings of the Lotus Sutra of Myoho Renge Kyo that's very specific to you. So I hope you pay attention to this Go Show um, and think about it deeply. As you know, Nichiren was a reformer, or he's in the West we call him a reformer. Basically, uh, he takes the title of votary. So what does that mean? Votary of the Lotus Sutra it means that he is someone for whom the scholarship and the history of all of Shakyamuni's teachings culminating in the Lotus Sutra is um, especially important as the true teachings, method, and ability for all people, whatever their color, state of finance, or or import or non-import, homeless, uh, castle, whatever, whatever your life condition, this method works and invokes your Buddha, your Buddha life, your Buddha mind, your Buddha perceptive ability. This of course transcends anything like this, anything samsaric. But ironically, the only way we can perceive it is through this samsaric mechanism. But just those statements alone is extremely egalitarian. Because if it doesn't matter what your economic status is, or your social status is, or your, your attitude, your age, your sect, your whatever, then how could it be that it should be different for men and women? And yet, ladies... You know, even today, in the modern era, we still rule by violence. We still have men asserting themselves dominant over women. And there's still, I, I mean, governments control women's bodies and what they can do with them. I mean, it's endless. If you're, listen, it's almost... It's almost, uh, I was going to say insulting, but I'll go ahead and say it. it's almost insulting for a man, myself, a white man in the West, to be talking about the difficulties of being a woman um, logistically, politically, 
economically, all of it, right? You could lecture me on that. But the point I want to make is that this Go Show is for you. Now, in Nietzsche's day, there were several schools of self self-programmed Buddhism um, claiming superiority and pushing him aside. Um, and Nietzsche is going to use that tool to talk about these women's rights. Um, but it's no different today. We have huge camps of fanatical fascists, I would say, Christianity in this country now. We have a jihadist uh, murderous sects of Islam. We have the Israelis wanting to commit genocide to establish their holy land. We have all sorts of religions going on around us, all pummeling us with their propaganda. And quite frankly, it could seem quite difficult to practice Buddhism, to really commit. Not just say, yeah, I'm a Buddhist. You know, there's a lot of people who will say they're Buddhist just because they don't eat meat, which is a, a very minuscule historic attachment to Buddhist lore. But that's not Buddhism. It's not about Buddhism. So how can this practice of Myoho Renge Kyo truly benefit you ladies and us men equally because guys without enlightened women we're going to have a real rough time in this life so you better want the ladies in your life to become just as Buddha as you Otherwise, we're going to be very lonely and struggling. Okay? So, this is for all of us. But I want to call out the ladies because Nietzsche is going to um, point you out here. And the reason he does so, one of the reasons, is because it was the wife who sent her husband to visit Nietzsche and bring him food and so forth. So... Yeah, he was brave, the husband was brave in doing so, but it was at his wife's urging that he did so. So look at the extreme benefit, reward of practice there, guys. So this one's called the Sutra of True Requital. And here we go. In the first year of the Koan era, 1278, with the cyclical sign Chushino Tora on the sixth day of the seventh month, the lay nun Senichi sent a letter via her husband, Abutsubo, from Sato Island to a mountain recess called Mount Minobu in Hakiri village in Kai province of the same country of Japan. So, she had sent her husband, Abutsubo, to brave the oceans, the, well, the Japanese straits there, to travel from Sado, where they lived, to Japan, mainland, and further into the mountains where Nichiren had retired in a small remote village just to deliver a letter. In the letter, she says that though she had been concerned about the faults and impediments that prevent women from gaining enlightenment, since according to my teachings, the Lotus Sutra puts the attainment of Buddhahood by women first, she relies upon this sutra in all matters. One might ask, who was the Buddha who preached the sutra known as the Lotus? To the west of this land of Japan, west again from China, far, far west beyond the deserts and the pa Pamirs in a land called India, there was a crown prince, the son of great king named Suddhodana. When the prince reached the age of 19, 
he cast aside his rank, withdrew to Mount Dandaka, and took up the religious life. At the age of 30, he became a Buddha. His body took on a golden color, and his spirit reflected the three existences, the Buddha who illuminated as though in a mirror all that had happened in the past and would happen in the future, taught all the various sutras of his teaching over um, teaching life over a period of 50 years. So there's a synopsis of Siddhartha going out to attain his enlightenment. Even though all these sutras were gradually spread throughout the land of India during the first thousand years after the Buddha's passing, they had still not been introduced in China or Japan. Even though it is said that Buddhism was first brought to China you know, 1,015 years after the demise of the Buddha, the Lotus Sutra had still not been introduced. Some 200 or more years after Buddhism was brought to China, a man known as the Tripitaka master, Kumara, uh, Kumarayana, lived in a country called Kucha, located between India and China. His son, Kumarajiva, journeyed from Kucha to India, where he received instruction on the Lotus Sutra from the Tripitaka master, Surya Soma. On entrusting Kumarajiva with the sutra, Surya Soma said to him, This Lotus Sutra has a deep connection with a country to the northeast. With these words in mind, Kumarajiva set out to carry the sutra to a region east of India, to the land of China. Thus, it was more than 200 years after Buddhism had been introduced to China, during the reign of ruler of the late, latter Qin dynasty, that the Lotus Sutra was first brought to that country. Buddhism was introduced to Japan during the reign of the 13th sovereign, Emperor Kimei, on the 13th day, a day with the cyclical sign Kanototori of the 10th month in the 13th year of his reign, a year with the cyclical sign Mizunoe Saru by King Xiongmyong of the Kingdom of Pachke to the west of Japan, that's Korea. This occurred 400 years after the introduction of Buddhism to China and more than 1400 years after the Buddha's passing. Although the Lotus Sutra was among the text introduced then, Prince Shotoku, a son of the 32nd sovereign, Emperor Yomei, sent an envoy to China for a copy of the Lotus and propagated it throughout Japan. Since then, more than 700 years have passed. Already, over 2230 years have passed since the demise of the Buddha. How, moreover, the lands of India, China, and Japan are separated from each other by mountain after mountain, river after river, and sea after sea. Their inhabitants, their ways of thinking, and the character of their lands all differ from each other, and their languages and customs vary. Right? We've talked about that in the translation effort from culture to culture, subculture to subculture, language to language, the difficulties of thinking deeply about the meaning in the word so that the translation would reflect that meaning, not an easy thing. How then can ordinary human beings like ourselves possibly understand the true meaning of the Buddhist teachings? The only way to do so is to examine and compare the words of the various sutras. These sutras all differ from each other, but the one known as the Lotus is in eight volumes. In addition to these, there are the Universal Worthy Sutra, which urges the propagation of the Lotus, and the Immeasurable Meaning Sutra, which serves as the introduction to the Lotus, each consisting of one volume. When we open the Lotus Sutra and look into it, it is as though we were seeing our own face in a bright mirror or as though the sun had come out and we were able to discern the colors of the plants and trees. In reading the Immeasurable Meaning Sutra, which serves as an introduction, we find a passage that says, quote, In these more than 40 years, I, Shakyamuni Buddha, 
have not yet revealed the truth, end quote. In the first volume of the Lotus Sutra, at the beginning of the Expedient Means chapter, the second chapter, we read, quote, The world-honored one has long expounded his doctrines and now must reveal the truth, end quote. In the fourth volume, in the Treasure Tower chapter, there is a passage that clearly states the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Law, so on and so forth, all that you Shakyamuni have expounded is the truth, end quote. And the seventh volume contains the splendid passage that reads, quote, their tongues reach to the Brahma heaven, end quote. In addition to these passages, we should note that the other sutras that precede or follow the lotus have been compared to the stars, to streams and rivers, to petty kings and to small mountains, and that the lotus sutra has been compared to the moon, to the sun, and so and to such things as the great ocean, a great mountain, and a great king. These statements are not my words. They are all the golden words of the Thus Come One, and they are the words that express the judgment of all the Buddhas in the Ten Directions, because they're emanations of, or imagine, thought experiments of Shakyamuni Buddha. All of the Bodhisattvas, and persons of the two vehicles, Brahma, Chakra, and the deities of the sun and moon, which hang in the skies now like bright mirrors, watched and heard these statements being made. The words of the deities of the sun and moon also are recorded in this sutra. All the ancient deities of India, China, and Japan were also present in the assembly. The deities of Japan, such as the sun goddess, great Bodhisattva Hachiman, and the deities of Kumano and Suzuka, are unable to dispute these statements. So he's giving the proper weight. His, again, he's addressing his own culture, and these other figures are very important to the history of Japan and revered, but they pale in comparison to the teaching of the Lotus Sutra of, the, of Shakyamuni which in and of itself would cause a lot of trouble for Nietzsche to say, right? Because these are dear, dear things in Japan. The goddess of the sun, I mean, we're, he's in the land of the rising sun, right? So Japan's identity, samsaric identity, is very inculcated into this, the culture. So to say that this teaching that came through from India to China to Korea to now uh, Japan is far superior. It's a bitter pill to swallow for many nationalists, right? This sutra is superior to all other sutras, including Shakyamuni's. It is like the Lion King, the monarch of all the creatures that run on the ground, and like the eagle, the king of all creatures that fly in the sky, sutras such as the devotion to Amida Buddha Sutra are like pheasants or rabbits seized by the eagle, their tears flow. Pursued by the lion, fear grips their bowels. And the, na uh, the same is true of the people like the Nembutsu adherents, the precept monks, the Zen monks, and the true word teachers. When they come face to face with the votary of the Lotus Sutra, their color, their color drains away and their spirits fail. As for what sort of doctrines are taught in this wonderful Lotus Sutra, beginning with the expedient means chapter in the first volume, it teaches that bodhisattvas, persons of the two vehicles, and ordinary people are all capable of attaining Buddhahood. But as of yet, no examples exist to prove this assertion. It is like a quest whom we meet for the first time. His appearance is attractive, his heart is brave, and on hearing him speak, we have no reason to doubt him. Yet, because we have never seen him before and have no proof of the things he says, we find it difficult to believe in him or to, to have confidence in him on the basis of his words alone. But if we repeatedly see evidence to support the major points he makes at this time, we will be able to trust what he says from now on as well. 
For all those who wish to believe the Lotus Sutra and yet could not do so with complete certainty, the fifth volume presents what is the heart and core of the entire sutra, the doctrine of attaining Buddhahood in one's present form. It is as though, for instance, a black object were to become white, a black lacquer to become like snow, an unclean thing to become clean and pure, or a wish-granting jewel to be placed into muddy water to make it transparent. Here it is told how, how the dragon girl became a Buddha in her reptilian form. And at that moment, there was no longer anyone who doubted that all men can attain Buddhahood. This is why I say that the enlightenment of women is expounded as a model. For this reason, the great teacher Dengyo, the founder of the Enrakuji Temple on Mount Hiei, who was the first to spread the true teachings of the Lotus Sutra in Japan, commented on this point as follows, quote, Neither teacher nor disciples need undergo countless kalpas of austere practice in order to attain Buddhahood. Through the power of the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Law, they can do so in their present form. End quote. And the great teacher Tendai Chi Che of China, who expounded the true meaning of the Lotus Sutra first in that country, stated, quote, The other sutras only predict Buddhahood for men, but not for women. This sutra predicts Buddhahood for all. So, this is going to be a big boost to uh, this lay nun. It's going to show her, sorry, computer stuff, um, demonstrate to her that in the teachings themselves, all of the teachings point to the Lotus Sutra and further than understanding that the Lotus Sutra is equanimous for all, that it especially points that out, makes an example of the enlightenment of this dragon girl. Not even a human in this story, right? A reptilian female achieves enlightenment in her current form. This is this is storytelling, but the point is that women are no less able to achieve and invoke their, the Buddha than the men are. No matter what status, no matter what sex, any sentient being can invoke Buddhahood immediately in this form, in this human samsaric existence. In fact, I go further to say that if you... You cannot attain Buddhahood without becoming samsarically manifest first. And that Buddhahood only exists for us in this form. In fact, practicing Buddhism, every time you chant Myoho Renge Kyo, and you focus with the help of this mandala of Gohonzon, you are invoking your Buddha. Don't be distracted by thoughts of, you know, when I die, I'll go to a Buddha land. That's, that's total bonarchy. It's not, that's not Buddhism. Outside of this life, there is no Buddhism. Buddhism only exists in this samsaric vehicle. Period. So how could it be any different? for you ladies than it is for us men. But only the Lotus, only this final teaching of Shakyamuni drops that bomb. And believe me, in his day, it was a bomb. A lot of people wanted him dead. They didn't like that he went against the, the grain. They didn't like how he redefined karma as something that self-determinated. Oh my goodness. The governments wanted him dead. Kings wanted him dead. Other uh, leaders wanted him dead. He, this thinking of the Lotus Sutra is so challenging to authoritarian dictatorship rule by might. It's so in the face of all of that. It doesn't matter what culture you're from, what war you believe in, what, you know, what religions...
See, Buddhists, there's nothing in our teaching that says go to war. Because Buddhism is all about internal development. The mind. Open the mind to the amazement of what it, life is. There's no competition. If there's a, if you perceive here from Nichiren anything that looks like war, you're misperceiving it. What Nichiren is doing is having a, an intellectual debate with the ideologies and the thinking that's ruling the land he's in because it's destroying the land he's in. It's like when, back in the 70s when we demonstrated against the Vietnam War. We weren't going to war with the support of the Vietnam War. We were demonstrating our dissatisfaction, our complete abhorrent perception of what the government was doing to humanity, to other beings. We were being a loud voice. We were trying to reform. This is what Shakyamuni did. This is what Tendai did. This is what Nagarjuna did. This is what Nichiren did. And this is our benefit because Nichiren is our latter day teacher who demonstrates for us how to stand up for our own enlightenment in the face of the any other forces. He gives us guidance on how to argue points. He shows us how the scholarship proves itself out. You don't have to invent arguments. It's all written down. All you have to do is find points. Not hard to do because they're there repeatedly over and over again. And certainly in the Lotus, they just put a final stamp on it, right? No, you can do this now. There's no magical, mystical thinking here. The moment you get that way, you're not practicing Buddhism. This is very straightforward, pragmatic, living your life human. Let's go a little further. Where are we time-wise? Okay, we got plenty of time. Yeah, we're not going to finish this in one, in one video, though. But that's good. There's a lot of information here, right? Okay. Do not... These interpretations make clear that among all the teachings of the Buddha's lifetime, the Lotus Sutra is first or primary, and that among the teachings of the Lotus Sutra, that of women attaining Buddhahood is first. This is the, a very big aspect of Lotus Sutra enlightenment, right? For this reason, though the women of Japan may be condemned in all the other sutras, the Lotus as incapable of attaining Buddhahood, as long as the lotus guarantees their enlightenment, what reason have they to be downcast? Here's the ultimate teaching from Shakyamuni, the originator, the original Buddha, enlightened Buddha, teaches us how to attain the very same things he attained, and he calls out the ladies as being just as equivalent, then why should the women of Japan feel so down, downplayed, sur, subservient? Rejoice in your Buddhahood. Of course, they live in a cultural, right? They're oppressed. They have to be careful how they practice, but so does everyone. Because once you start rattling the cage, people, people will react, even though they don't understand. So this is how we develop our Buddhist compassion, right? We have to nurture them into the path. They may not like it, but it's like when you got to clean out a little child's scrape. They cry and they pull. They don't like it, but you have to do it in order to heal the wound. And they come to understand that too. Now, I, Nitrin, was born as a human being, something difficult to achieve. 
read that the, what that means. It means that there's tremendous fortune in being samsarically manifest. And I have encountered the Buddha's teachings, just as you and I have, which are but rarely to be met with. Moreover, among all the teachings of the Buddha, I was able to meet the Lotus Sutra. When I stopped to consider my good fortune, I realized that I am indebted to my parents, indebted to the ruler, and indebted to all living beings. Because all of these are components of my instantiation, my good fortune to be in a place where I would encounter the Lotus Sutra. Right? It's just a tremendous depth of appreciation for finding this practice. Not a bad motivator to chant to your Gohonzon, is it? With regard to the debt of gratitude owed to our parents, our father may be likened to heaven and our mother to earth, and it would be difficult to say to which parent we are more indebted. But it is particularly difficult to repay the great kindness of our mother. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, drying out. If in desiring to repay it, we seek to do so by following the non-Buddhist scriptures, such as the three records, the five canons, or the classic of filial piety, we can provide for our mother in this life, but we cannot hope to do anything for her in the future. Although we can provide for her physically, we will be unable to save her spiritually, mentally, right? Buddhism is about the mind. So we can bake her a pie. We can do things in her life to give her some sense of joy. But we're not changing the karmic depth of her existence. No matter how happy you make your mother, it doesn't change her own mind. It doesn't alleviate her mental suffering it may alleviate it for a moment, but it doesn't help her next week. Only her development of her own mind of Buddha can do that. You see? Turning to the Buddhist scriptures, we find that because the more than 5,000 or 7,000 volumes of Hinayana and Mahayana sutras teach that it is impossible for women to attain Buddhahood, it is impossible to repay the debt owed to our mother. The Hinayana teachings flatly deny that a woman can attain Buddhahood. And the Mahayana Sutras in some cases seem to say that women may attain Buddhahood or may be reborn in a pure land, but this is simply a possibility mentioned by the Buddha and no examples of such a thing actually have, having happened are given. Again, Shakyamuni taught in stages and if he had come out, he was changing the nature of karma and making us responsible for our own karma. Radical at the time, because karma had been around a long time, but it was something that the only the elite educated class of Brahmins came to your home if you petitioned them enough, and they would distribute what your life would be. Remember, it's a caste system. So that was treated as the karma you were given. And Buddha comes along, Shakyamuni comes along. No, 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 that's bull crap. He says, no way, that's not how karma works. Karma is what you're built of, and you're the only one capable of realizing it, and you're the only one capable of influencing it, compounding it, changing it. Your karma is yours, just like your Buddhahood is yours. No one can confer it to you. Nobody can put it on a platter or a scroll and say, here's your Buddha. You, your Buddha is in your mental experience. Your Gohonzon is in your mental experience. This scroll is a tool. Invoking Myoho Rengekyo is a tool. But it's a very efficient tool, so why not use it? 
Since I have realized that only the Lotus Sutra teaches the attainment of Buddhahood by women, and that only the Lotus is the Sutra of true requital, for repaying the kindness of our mother, in order to repay my debt to my mother, I have vowed to enable all women to chant the Daimoku of this Sutra, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. The women of Japan, however, have all been led astray by monks like Shandao of China, or Eshin, Yokan, and Honen of Japan, so that throughout the entire country not one of them chants Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, which should be their foundation. All they do is chant Namu Amida Butsa, Butsa once a day, ten times, a hundred times, a thousand, ten thousand, or a million times a day, or thirty thousand, or a hundred thousand times. All their lives, every hour of the day and night, they do nothing else. Both those women who are steadfast in their pursuit of enlightenment and those who are evil make the invocation of Amida's name their foundation. And the few women who seem to be devoting themselves to the Lotus Sutras do so only as though whiling away time away, uh, waiting for the moon to rise, or as though reluctantly spending time with a man who does not please them until they can meet their lover. Thus, among all the women of Japan, not one is in accord with the spirit of the Lotus Sutra. Sutra, oops, they do not chant the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra, which is essential for their loving mothers, but instead devote their hearts to Amida. And because they do not base themselves on the Lotus Sutra, Amida extends no aid. Remember, Amida is a, a conjuring of Shakyamuni as a teaching tool. So even as a teaching tool, they're not getting the benefit of it because that's not what they should be focused on. Reciting the name of Amida Buddha is in no way for a woman to gain salvation or liberation for her Buddha nature. Rather, it will invariably plunge her into suffering. In grieving over what is to be done if we wish to assist our mothers, I have realized that the recitation of the name of Amida Buddha creates karma that destines a person to the hell of incessant suffering. Such recitation is not included among the five cardinal sins, and yet it is worse than the five sins. A person who murders his father and mother destroys their physical bodies, but he does not condemn them to fall into the hell of incessant suffering in the future. The women of Japan today who could without fail attain Buddhahood through the Lotus Sutra have been deceived into reciting exclusively the formula Namu Amida Butsu, which, since it does not appear to be evil, they have been misled. Since it is not the seed of Buddhahood, they will never become Buddhas by clinging to the minor good of reciting Amida Buddha's name, they deprive themselves of the major good of the Lotus Sutra. Thus, this minor good of the Nembutsu is worse in, it, in its effect than the great evil of the five cardinal sins. It is like the case of Masakado, who during the Shone, uh, Shohei era, era in 931 to 938, seized control of the eight provinces of the Kanto region, or like Sadato, who during the Tengi era took possession of the region of Oshu. Because these men caused a division between the people and of their region and the sovereign, they were declared enemies of the imperial court, and in the end were destroyed. Their plots and rebellions were worse than the five cardinal sins. Buddhism in Japan today is exactly like this. It is merely plots and rebellions in a different form. The Lotus Sutra represents the supreme ruler, while the true word, pure land school, Zen school, and the precepts monks, by upholding such minor sutras as the Mahavarachana and the meditation on the Buddha Infinite Life Sutra, have become the deadly enemies of the Lotus Sutra. And yet women throughout Japan, unaware of the ignorance of their own minds, think that Nichiren, who can save them, is their foe, and mistake the Nembutsu, Zen, precepts, and true word monks, who are in fact deadly enemies, for good friends and teachers, and because they look upon Nichiren, who is trying to save them, 
as a deadly enemy, these women all joined together to slander him to the ruler of the country, so that after having been exiled to the province of Izu, he was also exiled to the province of Sado. Here I, Nitrin, made a vow and declared, quote, There is absolutely no fault on my part. And even if I should be mistaken, the fact remains that I have made a vow to save all the women of Japan, and that sincerity cannot be ignored, especially since what I am saying is in complete accord with the Lotus Sutra. If the women of Japan do not choose to put resolute mind and conviction in me, or in me as the votary of the Lotus Sutra, not Nichiren, then they should let the matter rest there. On the contrary, however, they set about having me attacked. But am I in error? How will Shakyamuni, many treasures, the Buddhas of the Ten Directions, the Bodhisattvas, the people of the two vehicles, Brahma, Chakra, and the four heavenly kings deal with this? If I'm in error, show me how. In particular, the deities of the sun and moon are right before me. And since in addition to listening to the words of Shakyamuni Buddha, you also vowed to punish those who persecute the votary of the Lotus Sutra, saying, quote, their heads will split into seven pieces, what then do you intend to do? Because Nichiren strongly called them to ask this uh, in, in this manner. The heavenly deities have inflicted punishment on this land, and these epidemics have appeared. I'm going to stop there. There's a different tone to this letter, isn't there? He's really taking this woman by the hand in a very uh, kind of fatherly way kind of showing her what's happening right now and I'm sure what he's going to do eventually here after he's just you know shown this tremendous um, proof of the teachings of Shakyamuni and the enlightenment of women that whatever doubts this lay nun may have, whatever fears she may have, her resolve, her courage in sending her husband off to communicate to Nichiren, her steadfastness, he wants to greatly reward not only by saying, thank you, you're great, but displaying for her his depth of knowledge of what she's confronting. Not to scare her, but to show her the nature of her great achievement. Nitrin does this all the time. He uses it as a teaching moment. He doesn't just say thank you. He does say thank you, but he also adds all this depth of understanding of Buddhism, not just Nichiren, but of what he teaches, uh, the Lotus Sutra, and why what they're doing in practicing Myoho Renge Kyo is, is so amazing and powerful beyond their understanding. He's trying to expand their understanding so that they realize with every recitation the grandeur of what they're practicing. It's not just an idol, like he said. It's not just mumbling through the, the words just to say, yeah, I'm one of the, you know, I'm part of the group. He's exploring the meaning, the depth and import of this magnificent opportunity for perceiving life, the amazing opportunity we have as human, our Buddhahood. No different for men or women. Right? All right. Uh, we'll see where this goes in the next, I think the next uh, part two will probably uh, wrap this up, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, but we'll see. Thank you so much for participating, for being here. Don't forget to download the podcast. Um, I keep getting support. I get emails. I get uh, um, just some some wonderful feedback from all of you. So, Again, supremely grateful. Namo myo Stay healthy 
and keep your practice strong. See you soon.